Good afternoon. My name is Ray Tsuchiyama. I'm your guest host for Jay Fidel today. And this is Research in Manoa, a series about how research is changing our lives in Hawaii and globally. We have two guests today. We have, to my left, Dr. Kevin Hamilton, and also Dr. Takatoshi Sakazaki. And they're both going to be talking about our uh, theme for today, which is a poetic, a letter from the sky, weather influenced by the upper atmosphere. And I've been part of trying to raise the consciousness of research and manoa since the 1980s with the publication of Hawaii High Tech Journal. And I am honored today to really delve into a topic that is very scientific and with, with all kinds of ramifications about weather and climate. So I'm going to turn uh, first to Dr. Kevin Hamilton, who's a retired director and professor of the International Pacific Research Center, IPRC, at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Could you tell us something about your background and your leadership and what's the center all about? Yeah, it's great to be here with you, Ray. And uh, the IPRC <coughs> is a climate research center, and it was set up almost 20 years ago as a joint collaboration between uh, Japan, particularly the Japan Agency for Marine Science, uh, Marine and Earth Science and Technology, JAMSTEC, sort of the equivalent in Japan of, of our NOAA, and the University of Hawaii. And uh, Japan has uh, given us probably more than $40 million in the intervening 20 years to help our research. And basically, we're focusing on um, climate issues, particularly those most relevant to the Asia-Pacific region. And we, um, again, have many exchanges of uh, Japanese uh, investigators who come and spend some time in, in Hawaii, such as Dr. Sakazaki, as we'll see today. And um, our, um, basically, it's been very um, good for us because we've been able to uh, provide a lot of uh, sort of manpower, brain power, um, and be able to collaborate, of course, with the brilliant scientists at JAMSTEC, and also their uh, fantastic resources. So they have uh, computers we couldn't dream of having in Hawaii, and um, also uh, research boats and, and so on. So it's been a, a very uh, productive and very successful And I take it this, uh, uh, your investigation research in weather takes a lot of computer power. Yes, so probably our, our main expertise is computer modeling. And uh, so we have uh, locally our own computers, uh, but we use a lot of output from the, um, the computers at JAMSTEC and, and now RECAN in, in Japan. Yeah. So Japan's, in terms of sort of functional scientific computing, Japan has kept the edge for the last 15 years. And we've been able to, to uh, sort of glom on to the, uh, the, the, these fantastic computer. computer so so, so I, IPRC is not only a scientific research center, but a example of international collaboration. Uh, absolutely. It's, it's totally international. It was, it was conceived by a, uh, a Japanese colleague uh, tw over 20 years ago. And uh, again, the Japanese have put in probably a little more money than the, the American government at this point over, over the entire history of the center. So, so studying the weather is uh, very critical. Uh, in but what ways? Uh, uh, I mean, your, your PhD, your dissertation was on the effect of winds, the upper atmosphere. Uh, I, I think we're going to be talking about the impact of rainfall uh, in, in uh, again, the upper atmosphere and how it impacts um, the lower atmosphere and, and, in particular, maybe about uh, a better understanding of uh, weather events mm -hmm. like cyclones and hurricanes and thunderstorms and so forth. Could you give, why study the weather? Is this... Uh <laughs> okay, so, I mean, the, I guess the ultimate, uh, you know, practical benefit of understanding weather and climate is to be able to forecast, oh, uh, either in right. short term or long term. And so some of what we do is focused on uh, dynamics of tropical cyclones. So the interest there is on you know, short-term predictions of you know, very important events. But a lot of what we also do is, is uh, longer time scale variability. So particularly involving the ocean, so El Nino and uh, other 
even longer time scale uh, variations in the coupled ocean atmosphere system has got a lot of attention from, from our scientists and, and our collaborations. So again, the idea there is that we'll eventually be able to improve seasonal forecasting long, and longer period forecasting. Fantastic. So this is a prelude into our slides. I mm -hmm. think uh, Dr. Sakazaki and, and yourself can comment more on mm -hmm. this particular project. Can we start the slides with number one? What, what is this all about? Okay, so it's a little bit complicated. I'll, I'll let uh, Takatashi uh, talk in, in a second, but basically you're seeing the upper atmosphere, the stratosphere, and the troposphere separated around you know, 10 miles up, let's say. And basically up in the upper atmosphere there are, are processes that generate mechanical waves that come down. And you see they interact in the tropics with rainfall, or so we think. So maybe Takatoshi can say a little more. Yes, so our talk is about the daily cycle of the rainfall. The daily cycle means that we feel that uh, at a certain time of the day, we there is some much more rainfall, and a certain time of the day, there is a minimum rainfall during the day. So we are studying such a kind of daily cycle of the rainfall. And what we found is that such daily cycle of rainfall is influenced by the disturbance which ki comes from upper atmosphere, so-called the stratosphere region, above 15 kilometer in this slide. So that was the discovery. That was the, uh, uh, that was the insight to, to your research. Right. Yes. Right. Okay. So, yeah. so you can see there's, as, as you go along the equator there, sort of stretched out the equator, right. there are two complete cycles, so two, two highs and two lows. Right. And so the solar heating, as the sun moves from east to west, oh. it generates this downward propagating right. wave and has a particular strength around 12 hours. So in fact, if you have a barometer uh, anywhere in the tropics, I just use your phone these days, of course, and plot out the pressure every hour, you'll see the pressure in Hawaii almost every day peaks at 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. And that's a consequence of this mechanical wave. And this has been known for a long time, but what we wondered is whether we could actually find proof that it's affecting the daily cycle of rainfalls, which is a relatively small downward propagating oh. wind variation. So we used our fancy computer simulation models, what Takatoshi did, and uh, basically showed that uh, to some extent the, you know, this daily cycle when you get more rain on average than other times of day is affected all over the tropics oh. by this, uh, this downward propagating wave. So um, maybe you can talk about the next slide. Or so uh, slide two, please. Yeah. Go ahead. So this first, this is an example of the daily cycle of rainfall. And this is an observation around the Indonesia region, which have a very, very large amount of rainfall, climatologically. Mm -hmm. And this line plot shows that, again, a daily cycle. And uh, we see, uh, in this figure, we see two maxima during a day and two minima during the day. So our question is how can this be explained by the upper atmosphere? Right, right. So could you go to the next slide? So here superposed is the, our numerical simulation results. And in this case, it did not include the effects from upper atmosphere. So in this case, uh, daily cycle is almost one maxima and one minima. It did not capture the observed features well. So, but uh, could you go to the next slide? When we include the effects of the upper atmosphere, I mean the waves from the upper atmosphere, the, we can actually capture the, in this case, two maxima and two minima. So the results are become good, better. So this means that the upper, uh, uh, the disturbance from the upper atmosphere has a significant impact on the daily cycle of the tropical rainfall. And, and I just want to uh, mention 
this data, is, this line, of course, is based on a huge amount of data. Am I correct? Right. Uh, what, uh, how can you categorize? How big is it? <laughs> I mean, it's not a small amount of numbers. It's, it's a very large amount of data. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. So the, the blue curve that showed yeah. the observations, uh, that's put together from several years of satellite data. Wow. So, and the satellite data itself is different uh, ways the satellite looks at the Earth. So there's actually active radar, so it's kind of like the weather radar looking down as, as it goes by. And also uh, infrared and microwave fluxes are, are measured. So every hour, you know, that satellite will go, or every 90 minutes will go around the world and I know, produces millions and millions of numbers. So over, over um, you know, several years, you're talking about billions and gigabytes and even terabytes of, of data. So, uh, yeah. So, basically, people like Takatoshi, you know, you know, go to the internet and grab all this data oh. and, and make sense of it. Right. Uh, the of course, analyze it and, yeah. and, and it ends in that curve. Uh, are we through? Uh, there are more slides? Uh, uh, well, that, that's a, later, a different topic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, yeah. So, so, um, uh, you so, so the basis uh, or the uh, the work, uh, the research is really uh, on this uh, making um, uh, sense out of out of uh, complex data, and and then uh, giving insights to a correlation of uh, what's happening in our upper upper atmosphere right. does correlate to some event uh, that's actual uh, rainfall or massive or light or whatever right. on the ground. That's 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 a proven I guess uh, case right, right. now. Right. So, so from our perspective, sort of an abstract sense, it's very interesting we're able to get this effect from the very thin upper atmosphere. So again, if you look at the background behind this, you can see this is actually just a uh, picture taken from the International Space Station. So they just pointed a camera at the edge of the Earth just when the sun had gone down. And you can see sort of two bands, a reddish, uh, orangish one. That's the lower atmosphere. And then above, you see oh. the blue band. That's the stratosphere. Right, so right, right. Stratosphere is very clean, and all you're seeing is the, you know, so both, both regions are being illuminated by white mm -hmm. light from the sun coming just below the, from up below the horizon. And the stratosphere is very clean, so you're getting right. scattering just from individual mm -hmm. air molecules, which is predominantly in the blue and violet. So again, you could probably, you know, of course it's beautiful, in the space age we see right. these, these beautiful pictures. If you went to a tall mountain, maybe even Mauna, you know, Mauna Kea, and you looked at the right right moment, the right time, you might be able to see a similar kind of kind of view of, of the atmosphere. But basically the blue stuff, the stratosphere is very, you know, maybe 10 or 15 percent of the total mass. So there's so an abstract point of view, it's very exciting, we've been able to pretty right. clearly demonstrate this effect. It's also interesting because of course this, this, you know, when more rain falls during the day on average is a very common, it's everybody's experience. It's a little bit different everywhere in the world. But everybody, if you ask them, say, oh yeah, it rains more at right. night or during the right. day. And uh, so we have an, a part of the explanation for this that's important in the tropics everywhere. So it's kind of nice from that point of view. And then finally, it's very important from, again, a slightly abstract but sort of, you know, once you peel a few right. layers of the onion, it's actually very practical, be very practical. And that's understanding the interaction between the sort of large scale wind field and individual thunderstorms and convection elements. So again, when you see a tropical cyclone form, there's a sort of an interaction between the, the winds bringing more moisture in, producing more convection, and over a few hours you'll actually spin up a big storm. So that's one kind of interaction. But something much subtler happens on global scales. And uh, we don't really understand it that well, can't model it that well. And can we go to that topic after our break? <laughs> sure. And I think this is a, a wonderful um, a program, and we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Thank you very much. Hawaii is a place where you get to watch shrinks and others involved in psychology talk about the joy, the sorrow, the pain, and the bliss of being human. I am Steve Katz, and I am a practicing marriage and family therapist here in Honolulu. My guests are psychologists clinical social workers and others who are interested in helping people be fully alive. Please join us into this most human journey in consciousness and loving kindness. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. 
I also have a blog of the same name at CowieLucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. And we are back in our, in our really interesting interaction we're having about the upper atmosphere. And which has been a area that really needed more study and research. Uh, and this is what's happening at the International Pacific Research Center at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. We have our guests, uh, Dr. Kevin Hamilton and also Dr. Uh, Sakasaki, who is from, uh, actually we were talking before, and uh, he says uh, he spent his time in Sapporo at the University of Hokkaido, and that's where my, uh, my mother's family is from, Hokkaido, all over Sapporo, Chitose, Hakodate, all over that place. It's a wonderful, wonderful campus, and, um, and he took his PhD uh, uh, there in a, a climate uh, very much different than his native Kyoto. <laughs> Uh, which is in a valley and has its own microclimate, as we know, very humid in the summer mm -hmm. and very uh, cold in the, um, uh, very humid and cold in the winter. And of course, uh, Sapporo is on a plain with lots of snow during the winter and a uh, short, intense, uh, uh, great summer <laughs> in, 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 uh, without any uh, rainy season, uh, like, unlike Tokyo, where I spent many years. And so we're, we're in our second half of our program, and we're going to go into a next topic. And we're going to talk about a longer view of uh, weather and uh, research. And I'll leave it to um, either of you to uh, focus in. And whenever you want the slides, let us know. Okay, so um, just to finish up the daily rainfall, um, again, we have uh, a very subtle global scale interaction between sort of the, the winds and the, and the convection. And um, uh, Takatoshi's uh, nice work on the 12 hour wave gives a very particular window into that behavior. So it's, it's uh, forced by this upper atmospheric right. wave in the exact period of 12 hours. So wow. it gives us sort of a special case. Right. So we can try to understand the dynamics better and we can uh, try to see how well our, our computer models right. do on this particular case. So again, that's sort of going to be an opening to a much broader issue of, of uh, variability on days to, to weeks in, in the tropics. And so we're talking about more localized, uh, part one, right, uh, effects and so forth. And right. now we're going to more uh, a longer term. Uh, right. So, yeah. yeah. So um, in the, um, so of course, down here at the, uh, living at the surface, most of us don't know this, but above our heads, it's actually a very interesting phenomena going on called the quasi-bennial oscillation. So at low latitudes, you know, throughout most of the tropics, the prevailing winds there go from very strong mm. westward winds to very strong eastward winds. And they switch roughly every other year, it's not perfectly mm. biennial. And it's a very big, the winds are very strong, so they're almost hurricane force winds in, in each case. So there's this huge jet blowing up there. Again, this is above, you know, 10, 15 miles above right. our head. And uh, so this has been a very interesting phenomenon. And interestingly, it was first, um, the first hint of what was going on was actually uh, realized by a, um, an amateur scientist in Hawaii back oh. in the 1880s. Wow. So when they had the eruption of uh, Krakatoa, right. it put right. a huge amount of aerosol into oh. the stratosphere. Right. And it actually f went all the way around the earth on this jet, right. which people oh. hadn't realized before. And a guy called uh, Serino Bishop, who was a, a clergyman and um, journalist, very, very interesting uh, citizen of, of Hawaii in the late 19th century, also a very good amateur scientist. He was actually the first person to realize what they were seeing what they actually saw in, in Honolulu was very spectacular sunsets, right, right. which was, came from the aerosol. He was the pers first person to really figure out what was going on. And later on, he was also the first person to realize those winds weren't steady. He found another volcano which gave different winds. So he didn't have the full picture, but he uh, really quite remarkably... Wow. What uh, great, great insights yeah, to yeah. something uh, far, far beyond uh, where we live. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so anyways, now with modern observations, we actually see there's this jet, but it actually reverses you know, roughly every other year. And uh, more recently, we appreciate that it has an effect on the, um, on the sort of seasonal mean climate, particularly in the northern hemisphere winter. So again, they're kind of large scale, you know, wave-like perturbations that are generated in the, in, to make our weather in the winter, particularly in the higher latitude than Hawaii. 
And those waves sort of feel the upper atmosphere is kind of a boundary, you know. And so whether there's strong westward winds or strong eastward winds there, it tells how much it reflects, how much the wave can propagate through. Kind of like a, you know, if you look at a, um, a piece of glass, it partly reflects, partly right, transmits. Right. So the properties of that sort of upper boundary for these waves changes depending on the sign of this oscillation. So um, anyway, so we were... Been very, I've been very interested in this oscillation oh, my yeah. entire, actually it was back to my PhD right, work. Right. And, but something very strange happened last year, oh. and again, uh, I might have been the first, one of the very first right. people to recognize this, but instead of uh, a regular sort of one year cycle, right. we got a very unusual cycle. It looked to me like it was going to be very short. So if we go to the next uh, okay. slide. Slide number one, please. Ah, there we go. And this is a, um, so you can see different years there. It starts in 1998 right. to 2006 on the top, right. 2008 to 2016 on the bottom. And each height, so this is up again in the upper atmosphere. You see blues, and those are uh, westward winds, and yellows are eastward. Oh, so the one goes this way, the other goes this way, kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, so basically, if you look at any one level, there's a transition roughly every oh, other year from right. westward to eastward. Right. And the transition is, again, very fascinating. as right. the sort of propagate downward. So anyway, so that's, uh, again, lots to understand there. But what we found is if you go to the very end of the record, 2016, you see instead of the blue coming down from high up, right. there's just a little blue there. Yeah. So this is unprecedented in our modern record, hmm. so over 60 years. And um, I recognized something very strange was happening. And we actually wrote a paper in science with some hmm. colleagues at, at Oxford about this. And my uh, speculation, our speculation, which was backed up by some computer simulate computer prediction models, is that instead of you know having a real uh, westward phase with that blue, we'd have just a little tiny blip, and by the time we get to this winter, we'd be back to uh, eastward winds. Yeah. So kind of skip a beat, and that has a consequence. So we go to the next uh, slide. Very slide last two. One. Slide two, please. Very last slide. Yeah. So when there's uh, these westward winds, on average, you get a pattern like this in winter. So warm in northern Europe, warm in the lower 48 United States. Right. So last April, you know, we were informally at least making predictions. In September, I guess, formally in the literature, making predictions of a warm winter uh, in northern right, Europe, a right. warm winter in the United States. And, uh, of course, it's only, you know, it's not a, not a perfect prediction. Um, it's, it only sort of pushes the odds one way or another. But of course, it turned out to be an extremely warm <laughs> winter in the United States mm. and also a warm winter in, in Northern Europe. So um, we, um, you know, this is an example of how understanding the upper atmospheric winds, their effects on the, on the surface, but also sort of being able to anticipate how they're going to evolve from the present situation, gets you potentially some predictability up for a year or, or even more. So in this case, again, I think there's a measure of luck that our forecast uh, worked, but uh, we you know, said the odds would be that there would be a warm winter in the United States, a warm winter in northern Europe, and has been th the case. So, but in general, it's, it's another example, and somehow in the upper atmosphere, particularly near the equator, you can have a very long period, fairly regular uh, variability, and to the extent that's affecting in a systematic way, the weather in the lower atmosphere, it gives you, again, potential for predictability of a year, maybe even even more. Will this change in the future? You think this is uh, uh, a harbinger of, of uh, a... Ah, uh, well, <laughs> wait, this is very interesting. Yeah. Why did this happen yes. after 60 years? Right. Maybe it's something that happens roughly right. every 60 years. Right. It's possible it's connected with climate change, so the climate in the upper atmosphere is, is changing. And um, to the extent we can model this with, with, with comp you know, global comprehensive models, we do see a tendency for, as the, as the climate warms, for the, for the oscillation to become a little bit weaker, lower down, a little bit more irregular. But I can't say we know anyone anticipated we see this incredible hiccup, you know, unique over 60 years this time. So it's possible it's related to the long period changes in the atmosphere. It could just be chance. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we have to just see <laughs> the next, yeah. uh, as years come, uh, come along. Um, and, and so, um, uh, is this a topic for more research by a center, uh, this oh. particular area? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And again, so I'm involved in an international collaboration that actually 
involved about 10 different institutions now trying to do uh, sort of global, uh, very comprehensive model like this. So Dr. Sakazaki, how, how has been your experience after a year I at UH? Uh, has, been a, has, been, has it been a very positive, good experience doing your research oh, at UH? Yes, yes. I'm now, yeah, I'm now learning a lot from Kevin and uh, by collaborating with other researchers at UH. Uh, yes, so I think uh, I got uh, good progress in this year. Yes. And you have another year to go yes. uh, in your research. Yeah. Uh, when you go back to Japan uh, or anywhere in the world, uh, what are the things that are unique to the center? Is there anything that's quite interesting to you, how people interact or the computer use or modeling? What, what's unique for you that uh, makes uh, your research really flourish at the center? Here? Yes, at UH. Yeah, I think so. Here there are many meteorological scientists uh, in, uh, in the IPRC. That's a very good advantage for me because we can have a lot of discussion with the scientists who, are, who measure the, particularly the tropical meteorology. So that's the yeah, main very important topic in the uh, climate science. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Sagasaki and, and uh, Dr. Hamilton. I, I mean, we had a very interesting discussion, and I think uh, uh, we are in uh, a very uh, exciting phase in, in meteorological and climate research. And I see your IPRC is an international collaboration that's really showing the way to do science well and to make it a really a jewel of the University of Hawaii. Thank you again. This is Research at Manoa, and I'm sitting in for Jay Fidel. My name is Ray Tsuchiyama. Aloha. Thank you very much.